Sorry? Oh, yeah, I understand. Don't worry. <laughs> First of all, uh, I want to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, been a lovely meeting in a lovely place uh, in honor of a very nice man. Uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so, I've had uh, two wonderful international collaborations. One with uh, Helmut Rauch and his group in Vienna, Austria, uh, and the other one with Tony Klein and his group in Melbourne, Australia. I should say Tony Klein and Jeff Opat, for those of you who remember Jeff. Uh, actually, we began as uh, competitors uh, when we were all chasing the same minus sign. Uh, as you may know, uh, if you take a neutron, which is a spin one-half fermion, and let it precess, say, in a magnetic field through 360 degrees, the side of the wave function changes. And this fact is uh, deeply embedded in quantum mechanics, but it had not been directly observed experimentally until 1975. Uh, <clears throat> it was observed for the first time nearly simultaneously and independently by each of our three groups. Uh, in Klein's case, it was done by wavefront, uh, wavefront division interference across a ferromagnetic domain boundary. The experiment was done at, uh, in ILL. In Rauch's case and in my case, it was done using silicon crystal, perfect silicon crystal interferometer that was invented by, of the type that was invented by Ulrich Banza and Michael Hart about 10 years earlier for x-rays when they were both postdoctoral fellows at uh, Cornell University. Uh, I'd like to begin by telling you how this device works for neutrons, but uh, as an aside, I should tell you, well, I should remind you that Aronoff and Susskind had suggested in 1967 that this famous minus sign might be observable by electron interferometry. Herb Bernstein uh, suggested looking for it by neutron interferometry at about the same time. An appropriate interferometer of either type did not exist at that time. Uh, da, 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 da. How do I go back here? Yeah, previous. 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 Boy, this is... Uh, so uh, here's a schematic diagram of the uh, Bonza Hart uh, silicon interferometer. And uh, also there is a picture uh, of one there. It consists of three upright silicon plates uh, attached to a common base. It's called an LLL device because it has three Lowy transmission <laughs> geometry plates. Uh, and here, uh, here is a model of one. Actually, it's a model of the interferometer that is the picture of. This is a model. And uh, if you like, you can come up later, get your picture taken with uh, interferometer that belongs to Sam Werner. This one's made of aluminum. Uh, you know, it feels about the same as the silicon one. Of course, the silicon one very valuable and very uh, fragile, so I don't bring those along. But this is the same size as the, as the one that's there. So if you like, you can come up, have your picture taken with it, take it back home and tell your friends that you had one of Sam Werner's neutron interferometers in your hands. No one would know, you know, it, and, you know, it feels about the same. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, suppose you uh, have a nominally monoenergetic neutron beam. Uh, let's say it uh, has a de Broglie wavelength of about two angstroms, and, about two angstroms and direct it toward the first crystal plate, uh, toward point A on the first crystal plate. And let's say at an angle which corresponds to the Bragg angle of, the, say, the 220 Bragg reflection, which was in fact the case for this interferometer. 
The two outgoing beams that uh, leave the first crystal plate will be coherent uh, because the crystal is a perfect crystal and will automatically satisfy the bright condition in the middle crystal plate. In the middle crystal plate, two of the beams that leave those two points B and C and are directed toward point D in the third crystal plate uh, will mix and interfere uh, and have two outgoing beams which go into two uh, detectors which I label C2 and C3. These are helium-3 gas field uh, proportional detectors which have essentially 100 percent efficiency for detection of neutrons. So uh, the scale of the interferometer you can see there is about uh, what, 10 inches, 10 inches, 10 centimeters. Uh, we have some that are, I say, 20 centimeters in size. Uh, so here we have it. Here we have a matter wave interferometer operating over macroscopic distances with the Broly wavelength neutrons of uh, two angstroms or so. Uh, if I change the relative phase uh, of the two beams traversing the interferometer on, say, path 2 versus path 1 in that diagram, uh, by rotating that phase plate, that phase rotator, quite often it's a uh, plate of, polished plate of aluminum that's uh, 2 millimeters thick. And so all I do is rotate it, increase the index or fraction path length on one leg relative to the other leg. If I do that, the counting rate in the detectors, say C2, will go up and down, up and down, up and down. Well, the counting rate in the detector C3 will go down and up, down and up, down and up, 180 degrees out of phase. Uh, that is, uh, we're conserving the number of neutrons coming out because the silicon interferometer uh, absorbs no neutrons. So what's happening here is I vary the internal phase difference on path 2 relative to path 1. The neutrons are being swapped back and forth between detector C2 and C3. Uh, we do that almost every day. But, uh, people that come to the lab and see what we're doing are it's kind of amazing that this is happening. Of course, this is uh, sort of the magic of quantum mechanics right before your eyes. Um, here is a, uh, a pair of interferograms. They were taken uh, recently at NIST. Uh, shows a contrast or fringe vis visibility of uh, about 88%. Here I call the C3 beam the O beam, the C2 beam the H beam. That's a matter of nomenclature. Uh, note that the two interferograms are 180 degrees out of phase uh, with each other. The sum is a constant as required by the conservation of out outgoing neutrons. As I say, the silicon interferometer does not absorb any neutrons appreciably. Okay. Uh, suppose now uh, that I thread a line charge uh, uh, of density lambda. Uh, through a closed loop created by the beams in my neutron interferometer as uh, shown here and as envisioned in 1984 in the paper by Haranov and Kasher. Uh, if the line charge is along the z-axis and the neutron polar is polarized along the z-axis, the canonical momentum has an additional part which is mu cross E over C which I, I show there. Uh, and uh, if mu the magnetic moment is along as the axis, then at mu cross E, because E is radially outward from that line charge, is a solenoidal vector field, uh, just as the magnetic vector potential is in the usual AB effect. Uh, here again, uh, there is no force on the moving particle. The moving particle in this case is a uh, neutron carrying magnetic moment mu. And I again say I'll polarize along the axis. One calculates the phase shift by taking that canonical momentum, which is easy to get from that Hamiltonian. It has this mb plus 1 over c mu cross e in it. Integrate that uh, 
canonical momentum around the loop. Uh, I show there, and you get the famous, now famous, Arano Kasher phase shift formula. Uh, in that formula, sigma is plus or minus 1, plus 1 for spin up, minus 1 for spin down. Mu is the magnetic moment of the neutron, lambda is the line charge density. Uh, this uh, phase shift is independent of where that line charge threads the loop. That is, it's topological. So if you take that seriously, uh, we might just as well thread the loop with two line charges and double the effect, with three line charges, triple the effect, a million. Well, if you have a million, that's like uh, uh, an electrode, say a charged electrode, uh, say a charged rod threading the loop. Uh, these ideas uh, lead uh, to an experiment, which I now show. So uh, here is our silicon interferometer. Uh, the silicon plates are colored in blue. The charged metallic electrode uh, is outlined in red. Uh, the lines of electric field radiating from the charged metallic electrode in the center must end somewhere, and we choose to let them end on a, a negative electrode just outside of the loop, outside of the beam path. Uh, I show the calculation now at, on the top, which I've written in, what the magnitude of the expected results for the AC phase shift would be in this, uh, in this uh, experiment. Using Gauss's law, I can, uh, from the electric field, which is the potential divided by the, the gap distance, uh, lambda there, I, uh, I, I get a uh, formula in terms of the, the uh, high voltage potential on the central electrode divided by the gap. Uh, the result is 1.52 milliradians. That's what the theoretical result is. Uh, that's a very small phase shift. Those of you who have done interferometry in, in, any, in any context, that is a very small, small phase shift. Uh, how to measure such a small phase shift? First of all, we must set the spin-dependent phase shift to a point of maximum slope on a spin precession interferogram. Uh, Using the small adjustable magnet, which I've colored in, in green there, uh, do a spin precession interferogram uh, <coughs> to say sinusoidal spin precession interferogram is set at the point of maximum slope. Then we'll turn on the electric field. In our case, it's 45 kilovolts over a gap of 1.5 millimeters. <coughs> Count neutrons in the two detectors C2 and C3 for 10 minutes. Reverse the polarity of the electrodes, count neutrons again in the two detectors for another 10 minutes, and finally turn off the high voltage. Count neutrons for another 10, 10 minutes. It's a 30-minute cycle. Repeat this cycle 10,921 times over a period of two years. Okay, uh, I show here a, a spin precession interferogram for both the C2 and C3 detectors. Note that they're 180 degrees out of phase with each other, uh, uh, indicating again the conservation of outgoing neutrons. If we set the magnetic field to a point there on the abscissa of about 56 Gauss, that's the 3 pi over 2 phase shift point, uh, we're at a positive slope as the interferogram uh, C3 has a positive slope at that point. Switching the electric field on makes the C3 counts go up a bit because the AC phase shift is a spin-dependent effect. Uh, actually, only one part in a thousand. Uh, switching the field to negative, that is reversing the polarity of the central electrode, makes the uh, C3 counts go down a bit on average, up of order a part in a thousand. If you know the slope of that interferogram, that is at that point, which is green, I don't know if you can see that green from where you sit, the operating point, that's the inflection point. If we know the slope at that point, uh, we can convert then a difference in counting rate for the, 
for uh, central electrode positive, minus the counting rate for when it's negative, into a phase shift. That is, if we know the slope, we know the counting rate, plus and minus, uh, we can convert it into a, into a phase shift. So that, that is on, on the axis, on the abscissa. This is uh, what we call phi sub AC. That's the AC phase shift. That's uh, the number we're looking for. That's a, a number which theory predicts for this experiment is uh, 1.52 milliradians. Our AC experiment was done with unpolarized neutrons. Uh, how, how do we see spin-dependent effects with unpolarized neutrons? Well, there are two types of phase shifts. One is uh, spin-independent, I'll call that alpha, uh, in these equations below. And the other one is a spin-dependent phase shift, which I call beta. So for spin-up neutrons, the interferogram, it's a sinusoid, it has the form of A plus B, cosine alpha plus beta. For spin-down neutrons, it's A plus B cosine minus beta. For unpolarized neutrons, assuming that the neutrons that come out of the reactor and down from the monochromator are unpolarized, which is a, turns out to be a very good assumption, that you add spin up plus spin down intensities, and you get this nice formula, A plus B cosine alpha cosine beta. Cosine alpha cosine beta. Okay, uh, so this means then, knowing that, we must, we must set the phase, alpha, that's the spin independent phase, to be, say, 0 pi, 2 pi or so, and to make cosine, cosine alpha, say, 1 or minus 1. So we get the maximum effect. Uh, we do that, uh, we did that with gravitationally induced quantum interference. Now, we could have done it with putting that aluminum phase lag in this interferometer. But it's a fairly small device, and there just simply wasn't room in the interferometer for this uh, aluminum phase flag. Uh, so we just tilted the interferometer by a small amount about the incident beam uh, using gravitationally induced quantum interference, sometimes called the COW effect after the uh, authors of the original experiment. Uh, okay, so we set then alpha to be, to be zero. Uh, and we set beta, that's the spin-dependent phase shift from the spin precession interferogram to be either pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2 to select whether we want a positive slope operating point on the precession interferogram or a negative one. Uh, hmm? Hurry up. Hurry up. We'll have another 15 minutes. Now you're speaking too slowly. <laughs> <laughs> he, see, he knows what my extra slides are, and he would like me to show some of his extra slides. And we have some, we'll, we'll see. There's another speaker up to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's very important here that this experiment was done with uh, unpolarized neutrons because uh, phase variations due to vibration, temperature variation, uh, pressure, so on, affect the, the spin independent phase and not the spin dependent phase, okay? So uh, stability on the spin-dependent uh, interferograms is, is, is quite high for unpolarized neutrons. Okay, I show here. Here is a, a series of, of uh, magnetic scans taken at different interferometer tilt angles. That is, the gravi gravitational effect on the relative phase of the beam is different. As I, I, that's why I'm varying the tilt angle on the right gravity scans for different magnetic fields. So you go through this whole series of scans and you find where the setting points are, where the operating points are. And I show where, where those two, two, inter, two pictures, panels, where the phase goes through pi over two uh, to set the, uh, accurately the operating uh, points. Okay. Uh, I now want to tell you what the final result is, okay, of this uh, AC effect experiment. Uh, the result is given down below. It's uh, 2.11 plus or minus 0.34 uh, 
milliradians. That's, uh, and that, that's a one sigma statistical error bar on that, on that data. I show also the table of data, this difference data, a table of difference data. I don't expect you to reach any sort of uh, uh, understanding of that at any level uh, very quickly, but I do want to make some comments about it. Repeat, the experiment was done over an extended period of time, over two years. The data was divided up into two major segments, one and two, which you can see labeled, labeled on in this table. Uh, the reactor's built beryllium reflector was, was replaced in the middle between uh, segment one and segment two. The, <clears throat> the data was further divided into three parts, depending upon uh, whether we were at the positive, negative, or zero slopes of an interferogram. The total number, the total of uh, 10,921 cycles, you know, 30 minutes a cycle, you can multiply that yourself. That's some, something like 5,000 hours of data taking time. The counting rate uh, due to the application of the electric field, as I said, was about a part in a thousand. The total number of neutrons counted in the interferograms was about 100 million. Uh, less than 10% of all the data that was uh, taken was discarded due to reactor scrams, electrical outages, or electronic malfunctions. And finally, again, I say it was really important that the, the experiment was done with unpolarized neutrons as opposed <laughs> to polarized neutrons. Okay, this is the first measurement of the AP, AC phase shift uh, that I am aware of. Maybe the only measurement, direct measurement, as of right now. Okay, uh, Klein wants me to hurry up here, and I know he has other agendas here, but I, I want to uh, talk a bit about the, uh, the scalar AB effect. Uh, uh, now, you've already seen the diagram of the panel, the top panel, uh, a number of times already in this conference for electrons, but let me uh, say uh, uh, in my language so that you will understand the bottom panel in my language. You, suppose you have an electron beam which you uh, divide at some point and let one part goes through uh, on path one, another part goes on path two, but they go through metallic cylinders, say, with a pinhole on either end to let the electron come in, in, come in and out. One is a bias potential, the other is a pulse potential. So suppose I pulse the potential on while the electron is inside of the, uh, of the lower uh, Faraday cage. Uh, you know, the electron will feel no force because it's inside of a Faraday cage. Uh, but nevertheless, it will, there, will, there will be a phase shift that's uh, due to the change in the potential, and the uh, formula is written there. And this, uh, it, basically, this drawing is in the original Aronoff-Bohm paper. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, this experiment has never been done successfully, that is, without any force-connected uh, uh, effects from the, from the Faraday cages placed in the electron interferometer because of the small sizes that are involved. However, we have observed this, uh, an analogous effect with neutrons, uh, which is shown schematically on the bottom panel. Uh, the idea is the following. When neutron wave packet is on path two, it, it, <coughs> and is inside the pulsed solenoid, that's the bottom solenoid, which is a relatively long solenoid inside of the, the interferometer, uh, <coughs> Uh, we pulse the uh, magnetic field on for eight microseconds. Uh, it takes, for our experiment, it takes 25 microseconds for the neutron to go through that, uh, to traverse the solenoid. The magnetic field within the solenoid is uniform to about 1%. After 64 microseconds, the magnetic field is pulsed negatively. The cycle is then repeated many times. And by time of flight detection, one can tell whether a particular neutron was in the coil when the coil was pulsed on. That is, we have detectors placed at a certain distance away from the interferometer, and by when they arrive at the detector, we knew, know then uh, when they were inside of the coil. So you do by time of flight. Uh, you can tell whether the neutrons were in the coil at the time when the pulse was turned on. Okay. Uh, when they're inside the coil, it's a long solenoid, and the magnetic field comes up and neutron magnetic moment feels that magnetic field, but there's no gradient, uh, spatial gradient, so there's no force on the neutron. Uh, uh, magnetic field uh, 
mu b2 integrated over a pulse time of eight microseconds, uh, in our case, uh, uh, gives a phase shift, okay? And it's shown down below. So it's in complete analogy, as far as I can tell, with the, with the uh, e electron case. The original idea for such an experiment was proposed by Zeilinger in 1985 and by the late Jiva Anandan in 1987. This experiment was done also with unpolarized neutrons. Uh, uh, it was done with a, a skew-symmetric interferometer, and it caused some what I would call quantum confusion amongst certain theorists. Uh, and uh, five years later, we decided to do the experiment with uh, polarized neutrons, longitudinally polarized neutrons. The results are the same, and the results are quite beautiful. Here they are. Polarized, unpolarized, scalar AB effect. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about this whole subject, uh, I uh, sorry, we here's have time for the here's commercial. book. <laughs> sorry, we haven't got time for the commercials. Otherwise, I'd say Ta Tanamura could advertise Hitachi. I can advertise my book. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, neutron interferometry. It's lessons in exp uh, experimental quantum mechanics by Helmut Rock and myself. The, uh, uh, the it, it, 40 experiments, 120, 20, 1,200 references, 400 pages, cost is $100. Fantastic investment. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and and, the, and the, the, the illustration on the cover, the illustration on the cover, this is, this is what Klein want, wants to say. He's trying to stop me from saying this so he can say this. The illustration on the cover is, uh, was, is due to Charles Adams. It first appeared in the New Yorker magazine in 1940. Uh, <clears throat> Klein likes to call it the Charles Adams effect, the CA effect for, for short. It's never been observed. Thank you. You asked me in private, but just one comment from the chairman. People do beautiful experiments of this kind, but then along come the theorists and quibble. So I have one additional slide. Would you like to show that, please? <laughs> See, we knew that there was time left, didn't we? <laughs> These are uh, time of flight data. Where the experiment is done, this is the reactor at Missouri at NIST. No force. All right. This is your, your turn, Tony. Go right. to it. This is uh, a special for the now, we have one more speaker. I'm sorry for running out of time. Tony, it's okay. You have to get up on okay. the stage. Okay. No, I don't. Yeah. I just have to speak, so yeah, they can fine. hear. I think we can have one. We can manage one or two questions. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, we can have one or two questions. I'll stay here. You speak loudly. <laughs> <laughs> Any question? Yes? In the original experiment, how do you shield the neutrons from the charged fire? They're, they go, they're, it's, a, it's not a, yeah. so say it's a line charge for simplicity, okay, that the electrode is a, is a line charge. So radioelectric field coming out from that, neutrons going past that, and feels, uh, feels that it's there, yeah, there's phase shift from the, from the spin orbit coupling. So you don't shield the electric field, it goes, the, the origin of the uh, AC phase shift is moving in the, in the electric field, okay, it's moving in the electric field, okay. No shielding. But they can't touch the fire. What's that? Physically, they can't touch the fire. Oh, you mean the neutrons going through, uh, through the... the it doesn't do... Neutrons that touch, that touch the electrodes on either side are lost to the interference. They'll scatter out and they don't contribute to the interference. So in some ways, the gap, which is 1.5 millimeters in our case, forms a, uh, the beam width going through the interferometer, okay? So the neutrons that go through the interferometer Go through that gap. That's uh, how it's done. Okay. So they, the ones that are close and hit the, the hit the, the electrodes, that they don't have any. They're all, they're lost to the world. Okay. Other uh, questions? Yeah. Professor Kepler has a question there. Yeah. So um, why did you do the experiment with the unpolarized neutrons as long as it was only here? All right. Uh, well, it, we let me say it this way. We did the experiment with unpolarized neutrons first because it's much easier to do experiments with unpolarized neutrons. In fact, well, okay, the factor, let me finish. 
it takes a, about a factor of five in, in intensity. Doing with polarized neutrons, you have many problems because of phase drifts and things like that. So doing it with polarized neutrons is much more difficult, and especially with longitudinally polarized neutrons, polarized along the axis of the pul pulse coil. Why, why did we do such an experiment? Theorists were, uh, were quibbling with this at meetings, in papers, and so on. But I would like to, in, I, it, Klein has got to give me time for this one little comment here. One little comment. Which, this, this is this, this, this is this is for 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 for, uh, for Tony Klein's benefit, I think, too. Uh, in every respect that I know of, this is a force-free phase shift. This is for your benefit, Murray. All right. It is torque-free. It is non-local inter interferometric effect. It is dispersion-free and non-dissipative. This experiment is AB in spirit and in fact. Now you can answer. <laughs> the point is that the original unpolarized experiment, you can think of it as two experiments running at once. One for spin up and one for spin down, which is a mixture of things that come out of the reactor. And each give the same result. So why not do both at the same time and save yourself a lot of trouble? But then because of the trouble that they caused, uh, they went enormous lengths to polarize the neutrons, to filter out the uh, wrong polarization state, uh, and so on, and eventually ended up getting the same result. And they didn't put my name on that paper. Because I wasn't in favor of doing it. Well, you didn't do any work on it. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's only fair enough. Yeah. So here are the interferometers with the beams, if you would like to come up and how, how they go through, take, no, yeah, take a look at I understand that are polarized uh, neutrons for scalar effect. And uh, for AC effect, the, the only experiment, as you said, was done was with unpolarized. Yeah. Effect. Right. So you said that in, it's direct uh, AC effect, but it's almost direct. Oh, it's a direct. AC conceptually, we need polarized neutrons. Well, the theorists. So is there is a way to. Yeah. I, I'm persuaded that it's good. But right. I think it would be nice well, to have a demonstration well, that, of AC effect. It's polarized, so it would be exactly AC effect. But it was polarized. It was polarized up and down at the same time, different electrons <laughs> coming in, and they give the same answers. Who, uh, I think, uh, who is giving this talk, Tony? Is it you or me? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, let me answer your... In this way, the, the exponentialization is zero. Let me, let me, let me, let me answer your question in it in a scientific way, if, if I might. First, okay. uh, the unpolarized neutrons are coming into the region of the, uh, of the electric field, and, mu you know, and, the, and they see this motional magnetic field, which forms the axis of quantization. V over C cross E is the axis of quantization. In fact, in that experiment, I have this crazy slide up here, I can't go back to this other one, the, the axis of quantization is actually formed in this experiment from the leakage field from, the ma from that little magnet in there. Leakage field comes back up and is in the z direction. So in the region of where the neutrons are going through the electrostatic cell, the axis of quantization is in the z direction. The axis of quantization is in the z direction. The neutron has two states, spin up and spin down. Spin up neutrons propagate separately from spin down neutrons, OK? <laughs> we went through this little thing already, right, with the, with the earlier on, if you add spin up you know, the phase shifts in, in, in the interferogram. So, you know, in, your, in the AC formula, there's mu, you know, sigma dot, sigma plus or minus one, plus uh, one, plus I'm one. I'm afraid that it's, it's, okay, it's, well, it's, it's satisfactory. Right. But it would be nicer to have it, it's polarized, so it's yeah. very difficult. It's infinitely difficult. It's infinitely, infinitely, infinitely more difficult. Not and infinitely. Sam, it would only take 200 years instead of two years. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, is it okay? okay. Right. Anyway, you can come up if you like. These are available to look at. If you want to come, and uh, Klein has a camera, you can have your picture taken with one of, one of, one of my interferometers in your hand. Take it home. <laughs> All right. Take the picture home, not the interferometer. <laughs> okay.